that hurt. Warren Fadley is North America's most renowned extreme weather journalist. For the first time ever, he will be seen working on the front line documenting the power of two killer hurricanes within one week. This is going to be a real hazardous place in a very short amount of time. Battling against torrential rains and destructive winds, Warren continuously puts his life at risk in order to get his desired shots. Trapped in a garage by the incoming tide with no electricity, Warren has to stay awake and alert at all times, as one simple mistake could be fatal. Hurricanes are severe storms that produce violent winds of up to 200 miles an hour. Incredible 20-foot waves, torrential rains, and floods. Severe hurricanes can destroy almost anything that stands in their path. In August 2004, Hurricane Charlie knocked out the power to over 2 million homes and businesses when it crashed into the small town of Punta Gorda, which is located on the west coast of Florida. Thousands of people were left homeless, and at least 19 people were known to have died. Three weeks after Hurricane Charlie, a second mass evacuation has been declared, as Hurricane Francis is on its way towards Palm Beach County in Florida. Running away from home never solves anything, but this time it might save your life. I am frightened of the hurricane, yes. So I went through Hurricane Andrew. This is twice the size, so it's no joke. We have gotten all the water. We have gotten all the batteries. We have gotten every essential that we need. While most people try to avoid hurricanes, extreme weather journalist Warren Fadley and his chase partner, Steve Wachholder, spend their lives intentionally trying to get as close to them as possible. They travel across the USA photographing events that would be most people's worst nightmare. Chasing storms and danger is their way of life. But I am a journalist first and foremost, and when I go out, that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing. I'm looking for those shots uh, that you'll later see in magazines and textbooks. It's a good feeling when I go out to know the images and the film and the footage that I'm accomplishing will do some good. It will go back to either educate people or inform of weather. Then again is the adventure and the excitement of being in the middle of a hurricane, the, the chase of being at the right place at the right time. And as a photographer, the, the thing for me um, is to be uh, in the right place at the right time to accomplish a great photograph under the most demanding conditions. As the outer bounds of Hurricane Francis make landfall, Warren feels the pressure of getting the first few shots of the day. If he doesn't start working soon, he may lose a lot of good footage, which would cost him thousands of dollars in lost revenue. To Warren's surprise, the winds are gusting at 50 miles an hour, and that is why he is wearing his hard hat. If he is struck by flying debris, Warren could soon be on the fast track to the local hospital. Well, what's happening now is one of the first feeder bands of the storm is actually coming through. This is kind of the signal that the storm is, is beginning. And you can see out here the ocean, man, it is really getting agitated. Just an hour ago, it was just a little bit of white cap, but now you can see it's really starting to uh, surge up, and I can actually see where it's coming up here, probably two or three feet just since this part of the storm went through. So, you know, the hurricane's on its way now. As soon as Hurricane Francis hits land, storm chaser Warren is itching to get started. Whoa, look at that shot with the ocean and the city. <laughs> That is great! Look at that over there with the trees! It is crazy! After two days of careful planning, Warren is now in his element, working within the most dangerous weather on the planet.
I can't see anything because the water keeps getting in my eyes. This is a dream location. It's just good because we've got a, a great perspective of everything here. We've got the ocean, we've got the buildings, we've got the palm trees. Um, it's a dream come true. As opposed to other kind of storm chases, uh, tornado chases, for example, hurricane chases are very much of a tactical chase. Uh, you know, a, a journalist like myself almost becomes kind of a commando. Uh, you have limited equipment. Uh, you have to get into an area very quickly. You have to do your work. You have to stay alive. You have to watch out for all kinds of dangers because you're actually in the storm as opposed to a tornado where you're outside. So it is a lot like a commando operation. You've got to get in there. You've got to pre-plan the area. You've got to figure out where to shoot from and stay safe. You've got to do your job and then get out. You know, a lot of times when a lot of dangerous things are going on around you. As Warren snaps away, the awesome power of Hurricane Francis begins to remodel the local landscape as destructive winds of 75 miles an hour are beginning to take their toll. This makes Warren's working environment extremely dangerous, especially for those split seconds when all his thoughts are concentrated on getting that award-winning shot. Those few seconds can be the difference between life and death. And that is why Warren has got to be aware of his working environment and how it changes through the lifespan of a hurricane. Yeah! This is what it's all about. Warren carefully watches the churning sea as he does not wear a life jacket when he works. He therefore has to be very careful when photographing so close to the seawall, as one sudden gust of wind could easily knock him off his feet and sweep him into the abyss. Years of experience have enabled Warren to stay focused at all times, as he knows all too well that storm chasing can be a deadly occupation. Once Warren gets enough footage, it's time to head off to another deserted location, as over two million people have evacuated the state of Florida. 48 hours before, storm chasers Warren and Steve began their hazardous land pursuit of Hurricane Francis. The hurricane hunters of the 53rd Weather Reconnaissance Squadron are called into action. Their mission is to fly into the most dangerous weather conditions known to man in order to provide surveillance for the National Hurricane Center in Miami, Florida. The hurricane hunters are the only unit that flies into hurricanes on a regular basis. Their 11-hour route is both physically and mentally exhausting. Every folks in need to wrap up. My personal drive is that I'm a, I'm a thrill seeker. I like, I can't sit still. Uh, I like to be out on the edge. And as far as I know, this is probably the most dangerous flying in the military. And uh, not that I enjoy going out and doing dangerous things, but it is a thrill. Every single time I get in this aircraft to fly a storm, I get excited. I feel like I did back in the days when I played football. It's, it's just an awesome feeling. Every time a hurricane warning is posted, each crew member is aware that this could be their last mission as five crews have crashed into the sea. And that is why the enrollment for the hurricane hunters is on a strict voluntary basis. We're gonna pick up hail, we pick up some rain today. You're gonna see rain today like you've never seen before in your life. Uh, that won't hurt you, it'll build up, you just can't see very much. The hail will take the paint off the leading edge and won't hurt the aircraft. But uh, with the hook echoes out there, the tornadoes, that's what you really need to watch out for. Those can damage you, uh, actually they can kill you if you don't get out of them. The hurricane hunters are only a few minutes away from the most dangerous part of the hurricane, the eye wall, which consists of violent winds of up to 200 miles an hour that can flex the wings of the aircraft by up to six feet. The eye wall also contains deadly tornadoes that can suddenly appear from nowhere. If the WC-130 is hit by a tornado or a bolt of lightning, it could easily send the aircraft spiraling towards the ocean, where certain death would be waiting, as the WC-130 aircraft does not carry parachutes. Darrell therefore has to be on the lookout for unexpected dangers, as there is only one guarantee when flying through the eye wall of a hurricane, and that is that anything can happen, even your worst nightmare. Last year, I was flying a storm, a hurricane that was about to coast in over Houston, about an hour out of here. At cruise, we had a massive fuel leak in the number three engine, so basically we were pouring raw fuel into an engine that was running, dumping it on the engine, running any, about 900 degrees. 
Uh, we spotted it, we had it sh got it shut down, we started coming home. We couldn't stop the fuel leak because it was actually, the fuel line broke below the, above the shutoff valve. So we declared an emergency, came in and landed, and 45 minutes after we landed, the aircraft was still leaking fuel on the ramp. So we were told later that just a matter of minutes, that engine probably would have caught on fire. As the aircraft plows its way through the eye wall, meteorologists Nicole and Doug analyze the wind speed to see if there has been any sudden changes, as the information that they collect can improve hurricane forecasts by up to 25%. About 55 or 60 knots on the surface. Sitting through a hurricane is not something that I would recommend for anybody. Many people think they can ride it out. Depending on where you live in relationship to the water, you need to rethink that. If you live very close to the water, you have to understand that in a, in a hurricane, the water will rise very quickly uh, when the eye comes over your area. And uh, people, Nine out of 10 people who die in hurricanes die because of drowning. Without warning, a titanic gust of wind suddenly crashes into the WC-130 aircraft. Jay seems to take it in his stride. However, Daryl has to steady his nerves as the aircraft's resilience is tested to the full. There's an unspoken tension between the crew as the awesome power of nature holds their lives firmly in its hands. Violent turbulence continues to tear at the aircraft, slamming it from side to side. One strong downdraft of wind could easily send the aircraft crashing into the ocean. Even though the hurricane hunters are only a few miles from reaching the end of the eye wall, torrential rains and winds continue to hammer at the aircraft. Each crew member has been through this hellish ride on numerous occasions. It's only their vast experience that enables them to keep calm, even though their lives are in constant danger. Once they're through the eye wall, the heavy winds and intense rain suddenly stops. The eye of the hurricane is around 20 miles across and relatively calm with little or no winds, despite the fact that the winds and clouds continue to rage around the edge of the eye. The eye will often turn in various directions with the storm itself, which continues to move forward on its own course. Down below, the sea is still raging, which means that the crew are never out of danger, even though all around them seems to be at peace. Once the hurricane hunters have gathered enough data from within the eye of the hurricane, they head back home to Mississippi. Back on land, extreme weather journalist Warren is driving to his next location. He will have to stay alert at all times as hurricanes can produce deadly tornadoes that can suddenly appear from nowhere. All this equipment is, is really, when you think about it, I may have spent years waiting for the right hurricane, and the last thing you can have happen is have a piece of equipment fail. So equipment is so absolutely essential uh, to have the right equipment because if something fails out there, it's not like you can run over to the camera store and pick something up. You've got to be pretty much self-contained when you shoot. And that's why a lot of times I say, you know, hurricane chasing is like a special operations uh, deployment. You're going into an area, you're scouting it out, you pick your location, you get your shots, you do your job, try to survive, and when it's over, you get out. And that's basically my philosophy, and everything has to work perfectly. We gotta really watch for here wires at this point. These things will come whipping down and they'll take your head off, so. You know, if my guess is right, we're about ready to see the eye wall here. We've got to be really careful about the, uh, about this. When this hurricane hits and I start to shoot, I know where everything is. I know on my vest if I need a rescue strobe, if I need a light, I need a flashlight, a knife, uh, different lens, camera, film, all this stuff I have to have so I can just grab it at a moment's notice. The thing about shooting in a hurricane is you don't have time to really think. You almost have to, to react to everything. And there's things happening around you. There's, there's shots that come and go. You only have a few seconds. So you need to be able to grab something in a, in a second or less and be able to start shooting. 
When taking photographs so close to the shoreline, Warren has to keep a constant eye on the storm surge, which is responsible for 90% of all hurricane deaths. Storm surge is created when the sea is pushed ashore by the sheer force of the hurricane wind swirling around the storm. This advancing surge combined with the normal tides can create water levels of 15 feet or more. If Warren is caught by a rogue wave, it could easily kill him. I mean, these are big waves. You can see they're big, but they're being pushed back by this wind right now. So you can just imagine if this wind stopped, these waves would just be crashing right here in these buildings. So. When things really start happening around me, when all heck starts breaking loose, over the years I've been able to learn to really kind of slow down and put everything in perspective instead of panicking or, or becoming afraid. So sometimes I think the more dangerous it becomes, the more my mind actually slows down and takes everything in and allows me to work under those conditions. If the winds begin to change direction, Warren could get into deep trouble, as the storm surge could come over the seawall in a matter of seconds, with little or no time to get to safety. This is, when I, when I said earlier about a classic shot, this is really it. You've got your buildings with you behind you, you've got, you know, the palm trees, you've got the water coming in, but we just gotta watch the storm surge, because you could get a real rogue wave come in here. That could, there we go! You've officially stood in a hurricane now. See, if the wind stops for one second, this is what happens. And now you got a second one, so you got to really watch it here. That hurt. That sandblast is really bad. Warren heads inland as the winds are beginning to increase and change direction. If he stays, this will narrow his window of safety. Hurricane Andrew is a storm I will never forget. I don't care if I cover 10 more major hurricanes. Uh, hurricane Andrew was a category five hurricane. I survived Hurricane Andrew in a concrete parking garage. And sometimes the winds were gusting easily 150, maybe even higher. And we could hear in the middle of the night, we could hear things coming apart. Even though the hurricane roar was so loud, we could actually hear occasionally glass breaking or, or something crashing, and it was very unnerving. As a matter of fact, at one point, the parking garage began to shake so hard from the wind, the sprinkler pipes, the iron sprinkler pipes, began to work their way loose and fall on cars inside the garage. So Hurricane Andrew was one of those storms that, uh, you know, if you weren't in the right place at the right time, you could really have been seriously injured. And we were real fortunate that the location uh, that I chose for it survived the storm. Hurricane Francis is becoming a battleground of man against nature, as hurricane winds have increased to 80 miles an hour. As always, Warren feels the pressure of capturing vital images that will save lives in the future, as many of the pictures that he takes will end up in safety brochures for charities like the Red Cross and the National Weather Service. I'm just checking the, uh, the film. The last thing you want to do with a hurricane is run out of film, let me tell you. But you want to shoot conservatively. A lot of wave action, a lot of palms. That's you know that really is what people identify with hurricanes. I think more than anything else, you get damage in the city. It could just be a severe storm. But when people see this, um, they know right away it's a hurricane. It's a universal language for a hurricane. That's that's what I'm looking for here. Not too far from Warren, Chase partner Steve is checking how dangerous the wind speed of the hurricane is. What I'm holding here is a handheld uh, wind velocity indicator. Actually, it's called an anemometer, and it measures the uh, velocity of the wind. The weather's pretty dangerous today. Uh, you can get hurt, you can get killed in a uh, minor hurricane and in a major hurricane. And uh, even though this is a category two, which is not in the major category, any hurricane can be dangerous and you can get hurt and you can also lose your life in, uh, in a minor storm if you don't take proper precautions and exercise common sense. 
Just as the winds begin to increase to 95 miles an hour, Warren bunkers down with his video camera only a few feet away from the seawall. First danger is, is being thrown in there. You get thrown in there, there's a seawall. You're not getting out. You're going to float all the way to, you know, England or something before you get out of here. So you're not, that's the last place you want to be. And you have to be careful around these buildings because the winds can, you can get little vortices in here and the winds can come from odd directions. So real important, anytime you're near the water, it will literally come off the stick and knock you into the water. So you have to be careful. And also now there's debris, there's tree limb stuff flying around. So, you know, you got to be really careful of what you're doing. And something just went by right there, so. Hurricane Francis is not pulling any punches as a sudden wind shift pins Warren down. Warren's visibility is also restricted by intense rain crashing into his face like bullets from the sky. When Warren's hard hat flies off his head, he knows it is time to get out of the danger zone, as one sudden gust of wind could easily throw him into the sea. But Hurricane Francis was an easy hurricane to work in because it didn't have uh, the 130, 40, 50 miles per hour uh, winds that some of the, the larger hurricanes have. So in a smaller hurricane, a category one or two, you're able to move around and shoot. You're able to work in the storm. When you get in the higher categories, uh, three, four, and five, it's very difficult to work because you have so many things going on around you. The morning after Hurricane Francis's tour through Palm Beach County, one can barely recognize the landscape as it looks as though it's been crushed by a giant bulldozer. One of the most important and dangerous aspects of Warren's work lies the day after the storm when taking pictures of the damage caused by the hurricane. This is a great example of how really dangerous it can be to be out here. So it's almost like every time I take a step here, I've got to really watch what I'm doing in advance because of all this uh, debris. Another danger are these, these ship masks because a lot of these things will conduct electricity. So you never ever want to touch something like this because you have no idea with all these wires and debris, any of this could be energized right now. So this is a real dangerous area. This is amazing. This is a great example, probably, of the, of the luckiest person in Florida during the hurricane. This tree could have certainly fell this direction which the wind was blowing, but for some strange reason, it, it fell away from the house. But you can only imagine if there had been someone in this room right here and this tree had fell on it, it would have been a very unfortunate accident. You know, if you didn't know this was a hurricane, you'd think it looked like a war zone. It's just amazing the amount of debris and boats and things that have washed up on shore here. So sometimes it's just amazing to look at this and think that this is something that nature did. Tourism is Florida's largest industry, accounting for a tenth of its $500 billion economy. One of its main attractions is its ocean seafront resorts that are vulnerable to hurricane strikes. As soon as a hurricane warning is posted, Florida's $50 billion tourism industry slowly grinds to a halt. The once crowded beaches are abandoned faster than the incoming tide. The economic effect of a single hurricane hitting Florida is unimaginable. Insurance losses alone can run up to $10 billion. Tourist-related industries such as hotels and restaurants can lose up to $90 million in revenue. What makes matters worse is that you just can't stop a hurricane from striking its chosen destination. Six days after Hurricane Francis flattened Palm Beach County, the people of Florida have to once again take cover as a third hurricane named Ivan is now raging towards them. The hurricane hunters are once again called into action. A typical hurricane warning costs $192 million US. Narrowing the warning by just one mile can save up to $640,000.
The hurricane hunters also save many lives each year, as coastal areas need at least 48 hours to evacuate vulnerable populations. We could fly through there and it's nice and smooth. Just a few bumps, and then when you get the storm, maybe even a Cat 1 or a Cat 2, if it's building or dropping off, that's when you get the rough ride. So we'll see if it changes on us. You know, we could have some uh, big changes today, so that could affect our ride. We might be getting, uh, you know, pretty good bumps, but we'll see how it works. The Hurricane Hunter's aircraft of choice is the WC-130 Hercules, built in 1964 at a cost of $13 million. It is 99 feet in length and 38 feet wide with a wingspan of 132 feet. The WC-130 Hercules has four upgraded turboprop engines, two external 1,400-gallon fuel tanks, as well as an internal 1,800-gallon fuel tank. This allows the aircraft to stay aloft for up to 15 hours throughout each mission at a modest speed of 300 miles an hour. The WC-130 aircraft is also equipped with sensors installed outside of the wings that measure temperature, humidity, and wind speed. This information, along with the evaluation of other meteorological conditions such as turbulence, icing, and visibility, is encoded by the onboard meteorologist and transmitted by satellite to the National Hurricane Center in Miami, Florida. As soon as the aircraft is out at sea, meteorologist Lieutenant Nicole Mitchell observes the churning seas below, estimating the strength of the wind direction by how the waters look. John the Navigator is on the lookout for tornadoes, whilst Jay prepares the drop zone cylinders that are used to measure the pressure and strength of the hurricane. Well, what's about to happen is approximately about an hour and a half, two hours from now, we're going to run a storm into checklist. We're going to go ahead and get everything set up for the storm, brief it up. Each crew member is going to discuss exactly what everybody else is going to do and what they're going to do. We're going to descend down to 10,000 feet and start 105 miles from the center of the storm. We're going to fly in, gathering data all the way through, and drop a sign at the eye wall going in, the exact center of the storm, and then the eye wall going out, and we'll track information for 105 miles all the way out of the storm. Turn crosswind and come in and do the same thing on the other side. And what we do is we compare those points every time we go through the center with the last point and it give us the direction of movement, the speed of movement. And I, also, we collect the wind data as far as the strength of the storm, the pressure, the temperature, and whatnot. Once they're through the eye wall and into the eye of the hurricane, Jay becomes the busiest member of the crew. He drops a cylinder every 400 miles. 10 seconds after being released from the aircraft, the cylinder deploys a parachute that falls at a rate of 2,500 feet per minute. As the cylinder drifts, it calculates the wind speed and wind direction of the hurricane, as well as a vertical atmospheric profile of temperature and humidity. The information that the cylinder collects is then relayed via high-frequency radio back to the WC-130 aircraft. As soon as Jay collects the data, he immediately sends it via satellite to the National Weather Center in Florida. The meteorologists and scientists then begin to work around the clock analyzing the data as well as studying maps and satellites. Only then are they able to predict where Hurricane Ivan is going to make landfall. Within 48 hours of the hurricane warning being posted, Warren and his chase partner Steve arrive at the National Weather Center in order to get up-to-date reports from the meteorologists. This will help them determine the landfall of Hurricane Ivan before they begin their chase. The forecasts are issued here, uh, the predictions of where the hurricane's gonna make land strikes, the intensities, things that can potentially save people's lives. For me as a storm chaser, it's very important to have this information to decide where I'm gonna go uh, beforehand, of course, to go scout out a location. Also, when the storm's hitting, I need to know the intensity and the way it's moving for my own safety. Can you imagine if that was hitting the Florida coast right now as that hurricane? That would be that size, that strength. Yeah. It's, uh, would be unbelievable. It's really kind of difficult to fathom the uh, the damage that this thing would cause if it hit a major metropolitan area at its current uh, intensity. This thing hit land right now. You're talking 155 mile an hour sustained winds gusting to maybe 180, you know, 
15 foot storm surge, easy, torrential rains, major power outages, just a complete breakdown of the uh, infrastructure of the uh, metropolitan area that it, that it hits. Yeah. This is a map. As soon as they have gathered enough information, Warren and Steve begin their pursuit of Hurricane Ivan by driving 700 miles to Pensacola, Florida. Well, it's been just about a week since I left Florida from chasing Hurricane Francis, and believe it or not, this is the third major hurricane approaching the Florida Panhandle, now Hurricane Ivan, so this has been an incredible year. It's almost like Mother Nature declared war on Florida one after another hurricane, and there's even a, a fourth uh, tropical system in the Atlantic that might be hitting here next week. So this is unprecedented, not only in history, but also as far as my chasing goes, to, to have hurricane after hurricane like this. If Hurricane Ivan uh, turns out to be as destructive as, say, a hurricane like uh, Andrew, you're looking at catastrophic damage, um, almost complete failure of uh, most homes and extensive damage to businesses. And it, it's going to be uh, a real hardship on the people that live in the area where this storm makes landfall. Hurricane Ivan is a killer storm. It's killed 60-some people even before it's reached the U.S. coastline. And historically, when you have these killer hurricanes, they usually just don't disappear. They usually go on and, and create more violence. So in the back of my mind as I'm driving towards the expected landfall of Ivan, I'm thinking uh, and remembering that this is a, a killer hurricane. As soon as Warren arrives at Pensacola, he finds a bunker-like garage that will be his home for the next 24 hours. He then decides to scout out the local area in order to stay one step ahead of the deadly hazards that Hurricane Ivan will create. The storm's going to hit. A lot of the storm's going to hit tonight when it's dark. The eye wall's going to come in probably sometime around between 1 and 3, so it's going to be dark. But there will be enough time in the morning to shoot. Right when the sun comes up, I'm going to be out here. So I want to see what's out here. I want to see if there's manhole covers. You know, we have a manhole cover right here. That's something I'm going to make a mental note of. I do not want to be near that manhole cover because it may pop up. There's not a lot of them here. There's not a lot of drains. So this is really a safe area to be. And I know here, looking at this, if I stay on the sidewalk, I'm going to be safe. The only problem, we have a lot of glass on this building across from us here. That's the only issue right now. You can see here, the water's starting to pile up right now. This is already scary. I mean, the storm's not here. There's not much wind, and this water is starting to come over the deck here. So you can imagine, once the wind starts, and you can hear these sounds of the wind going through the ship masts here, very, very ominous sound right now. It's like the orchestra's, you know, getting ready to start playing. This is not Francis. This is a really spooky storm. Because you start hearing these weird little sounds and things crashing, and it, it, the sound will just grow. As the storm gets closer, all these little sounds you hear will start to get louder and louder, and there'll be more of them until there's just one continuous, hellacious sound. It's the devil clearing his throat. That's what it is. This is going to be a wild looking place in a few hours. Hurricane Ivan is only a few hours away from Pensacola Harbor. It will make landfall with winds in excess of 130 miles an hour. Warren's workplace will become hell on earth. Well, this is the beginning of the hurricane. The winds are now easily gusting to 75 plus. We may have had a couple higher gusts here. It's been hard to stand a couple times. A lot of debris in the road now. A lot of trees are leaning over. The signs are beginning to bend. So this is the beginning of the storm. One other thing that fascinates me about storm chasing is, in a way, it's like a treasure hunt. Uh, and that's something that really fascinates me. I've always said if I wasn't a storm chaser, I'd, I'd probably be out looking for treasure because you know, that, that one shot to me is, is really the prize. And when you go out after any hurricane or any storm, uh, the anticipation of never knowing what you're gonna see, what you're going to accomplish, uh, to me is really a driving force. That mystery of, of getting the great shot is just really something I find fascinating.
Warren must work as quickly as possible as the hurricane winds are beginning to increase with every passing minute. The winds are increasing and the clock is ticking. Hey, what's happening here? This came up real suddenly. We were having about 30, 40 miles per hour, and then within just a few minutes, it went to hurricane strength real fast. But that just shows how violent the storm is. Having got the first few shots of the evening, Warren heads down to the promenade, where he is encountered by a 90 mile an hour gust of wind that nearly knocks him off his feet. Warren suddenly darts between two tall buildings where he is thrashed by intense winds that are being deflected down on him. The immense pressure of the wind makes it difficult for Warren to stand up straight, never mind trying to hold a camera steady. I gotta be real careful here because some of the shutters are already breaking off the building, so this is gonna be a real hazardous place in a very short amount of time. Fueled by the desire to get more footage, Warren heads back to the combat zone of the promenade. Warren is fighting against winds that are now gusting at 99 miles an hour. Debris from the nearby boats are being turned into deadly missiles that Warren is not able to see due to the sudden drop in light. This makes the promenade a very dangerous place to work from. As the battleground becomes more intense, Warren has to use his hard hat as a windbreaker. However, this restricts his visibility from the flying debris. One unlucky strike could be fatal. Oh. As Hurricane Ivan smashes its way through the promenade, Warren can barely stay on his feet as winds of 105 miles an hour are crashing into him. If this is about the limit you can shoot in without having a lot of really dangerous debris flying around, so... This is about it. I gotta start heading back and find some kind of a wind block right now. somebody on a boat out there. I can see a light. Somebody, it looks like, they're actually trying to guide the boat out there. I, I cannot believe this. Yeah, you gotta really be careful here because you got a lot of wind, you got a lot of debris flying around. This, this, this wind really stings when it hurts. I mean, it feels like rocks hitting you at this point. That thing's really going now. It's gonna be all downhill from here on out. Oh, the lights are going to go. There we go. We just lost the power. Warren decides that it's time to head back to the reinforced concrete garage as Pensacola struggles to control the deadly forces of Mother Nature. Well, that was round one of Hurricane Ivan. It was a lot of fun. It got kind of crazy there for a while, especially between the buildings where the winds channel. Uh, but the hurricane's definitely here, and from here on out for about the next 12 hours or more, it's just going to be uh, pandemonium. Warren is desperately looking for the last few shots of the night. As past experience has taught him that the strength of the storm surge and the hurricane winds will soon knock out all surrounding power capsizing him into complete darkness for the rest of the night. Warren suddenly stops work in order to monitor the storm surge. Storm surge is a mound of ocean water that is driven inland by severe hurricane force winds. The garage is less than 200 feet from the promenade, and therefore Warren could be drowned if the water rises towards life-threatening levels. The monster from the sea is able to sweep away anything in its path. Even a 700-pound solid steel recycling bin stands little chance against the hammering effects of breaking waves. Once the power goes, Warren scrambles around the back of his car for a flashlight, the one piece of equipment that can save his life. I'm going to warn you, this is going to look bad, but don't get freaked out. The storm surge has advanced so much into the garage that Warren is trapped with no escape routes. 
Well, we're at the height of the storm right now. The eye wall's passing over us. And I'm really glad I picked this, the garage, to shoot from tonight. We've got a major storm surge covering the city. The whole lower floor of this garage is covered in water right now with a Category 4 storm. And you've already got several feet of water. It doesn't take a lot more to bring it up a little bit higher. And this is a real problem here if you have the water come up here because there's only so many floors. And after you go to the third, there's nowhere else to go but in the water. Believe it or not, this is the bay. This is it coming right into the parking garage. It's right here. The entire lower floor is flooded. This is amazing, absolutely amazing. Look at this. This is a good example of how, how severe the storm surge is. There's actually cars down here that are completely covered. It wasn't too long ago, I was actually walking down here. But this is the actual ground floor of the parking garage right now. I'll tell you what, if there's, if there's anybody in this city right now, in this portion of Pensacola, if there's anyone out here that's in this, they're in a lot of trouble right now because this storm surge is incredible. In all my years of chasing, I've never seen anything like this. The wind has just driven literally probably four or five feet of water up here to where I am right now. The whole lower floor is completely flooded. This storm surge is a great example of how dangerous my line of work can be. And if I didn't do the right planning here earlier in the day, I'd be in a lot of trouble right now if I was out anywhere near that bay. Warren carefully looks for signs of the water retreating back to the ocean. Absolutely amazing. I'll tell you what, when I'm done tomorrow and this water goes down, I'm gonna kiss this garage because it saved us. I would say this garage saved everyone that was in here chasing tonight, this garage probably saved their lives. Satisfied that the storm surge is not going to reach the next level of the garage, Warren heads back to the safety of his car. Four hours later, with no sleep whatsoever, Warren starts to get ready, as once the sun rises, he will have to push himself beyond his breaking point. When you're tired, you have to kind of double check everything because when you're dealing with fatigue, that's always an issue. As the morning breaks, Pensacola resembles an underwater city cut off from all civilization. Even though the hurricane has weakened, winds are gusting at 80 miles an hour. The violent storm surge is still crashing into the building with the force of a minor earthquake. Warren therefore has to carry on working from the safety of the reinforced concrete garage, as flooding and tornadoes have killed up to 16 people throughout the southern states of the US. Well, you know, there's a lot of great shots here right now. And as a journalist, this is why I'm here. This is why I've done everything to get here. But uh, you know, the human side of me realizes I've seen debris float down in the storm surge of people's property. and. A lot of homes destroyed, so, you know, the other side of me is saying a lot of people have, have lost in this hurricane. So, as a journalist, I'm glad to get the shots, but at the same time, my heart really goes out to the people who've been affected. One of the most dangerous times when you're chasing a hurricane is right after. you got power lines down, you've got, you got broken trees, there's still debris flying through the air right now behind me. So, this is a real dangerous time. The storm surge is retreating back into the bay, so even though it, it it's not the height of the storm, but the main storm's gone. This is a very dangerous time to be out here. Warren heads down to the first floor of the garage in his relentless pursuit to get better shots, even if the risk of getting injured is higher. You can have absolutely anything in storm surge. There can be electrical lines, debris, nails, um, all kinds of dangerous stuff. So manhole covers, storm surge is really dangerous. You gotta be really, really careful when you're in it, but unfortunately, a lot of the best shots, you got to be in the storm surge. I'm going to see how deep it is first. I'm not doing this for any other reason than to get a shot of a car trapped over here. I know there's a ledge here somewhere. I'm just waiting to hit it. Whilst wading through the storm surge, all of Warren's senses have to be on full alert for unseen dangers such as gas leaks and live electrical cables lying under the water. 
There is no room for mistakes, as every movement has to be carefully choreographed. Each step has to be monitored in order to avoid the deadly hazards in waiting. Not the time to have a technical difficulty. One of the things I like to do is get different perspectives. And getting down in the water really gives people a feel for what it's like to be in this storm surge. And although I'm out here doing this right now, you know, some of these photos will eventually be used for things like textbooks and safety brochures. People will see these and they'll learn. So this does have, a, when I'm out here, it does have a value. I'm gonna be real, 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 real careful. If I get in there, if I get out where it's moving, I may not get out. So I'm gonna be real, real careful here. An extreme weather journalist is a lawless profession that tests the limits of safety. It's gonna be a good shot. He's gotta make sure I don't get in trouble here. Although Warren is aware of the risks, he knows that he is covering one of the most important hurricane stories in the last decade. Warren, therefore, has to cross the line between observer and warrior in order to get the perfect shot that tells the story of Hurricane Ivan. Once he gets his desired shots, Warren heads back into the safety of the garage. I think fear really comes from situations that people aren't familiar with, and that creates panic. I'm not in any fear right now because I really know what's going on here. I'm experienced enough to know where I can go and where I can't go, but you still have to be careful. Not having had any sleep in the last 48 hours, Warren has to constantly fight off fatigue as his energy levels are rapidly depleting. Although exhausted, Warren gets into position for the final leg of Hurricane Ivan. Suddenly, out of nowhere, many tornadoes begin to swirl past the entrance of the garage. They are appearing so quickly and are so violent that if one crashes into the glass-paved building opposite Warren, he would have little time to get out of the way of the falling debris. This endurance test is pushing Warren's body to the limit as he struggles to keep his balance whilst being whipped by 80 mile an hour winds. As always, Warren is prepared to stay in the line of fire for that one great shot. As another gust of wind crashes into Warren, he has little time to think. He clamps his hands onto a branch and hangs on for dear life. Warren keeps a firm grip on the branch until the winds die down. Only then can he head back into the safety of the garage. That's, that's when it gets a little bit too hairy out there. That's crazy. Unable to take any more, Warren staggers towards his car as this hurricane is over for him. I don't really think about chasing as, as being risky. I think of it more of a, as, as a journalistic pursuit. In other words, some journalists uh, cover war. Uh, some journalists uh, cover sports. Uh, there's just all different kinds of, uh, of journalism. I happen to choose uh, weather and natural disasters because I didn't really want to shoot things that were man-made, man against man, violence and wars. I wanted to be uh, just covering something a little bit different. Even with all of his experience, Warren is still shaken by the devastation caused by Hurricane Ivan. The damage is so bad, I can't even remember where I took the before and after photos. In less than 12 hours, the wrath of Hurricane Ivan has obliterated Pensacola. The once so proud boats that moored in the bay have been mangled beyond recognition at a cost of three to $10 billion. Lives and homes have been destroyed, not by man, but by the deadliest weather machine on Earth. The people of Pensacola will remember Hurricane Ivan as the deadliest storm they have had to endure, as widespread flooding has increased the death toll in the southern states of the U.S. to 40. A further 80 were killed throughout the Caribbean,
a real dangerous area here. You know, they probably should close this road off as soon as possible. You got a lot of debris that's just hanging there. It just takes one little gust to drop that out of there, so. You know, you can see this disaster is so new that the authorities haven't even got out here yet, so that's one of the reasons it's so dangerous right now. That's probably what I'll remember more about Hurricane Ivan than anything else is getting to the right place at the right time and getting through it safely. After getting a few more shots of the devastation, Warren begins his long journey back home to Arizona. I know someday when I'm too old to chase, I'm gonna look back and wonder if all this was worth it. Uh, not having a family, not having that, that real steady type relationship that believe it or not is something I really value. And it's kind of ironic, someone like me who's a very, believe it or not, romantic guy who believes in, in, in relationships and families and things like that, has had to give all that up for my career, for chasing. And there's many times when I think about it, I wonder if, if all this is going to be worth it or not. Uh, you know, it's just a question that will have to be answered someday.